Welcome back to Leftist Labor History. My name is Nate and I'm your host. And we're going to have a short intro and then we're going to get into the new deal. Okay. So this is a big one. Um, I realized as I was kind of preparing for this episode that these are, these are all big ones, right? If you're, you, we're covering a lot of history and a lot of really important stuff in seven, seven, seven short episodes. So it's really kind of a whirlwind and I encourage anybody to really dig deep into anything that, you know, particularly interests you because there's a lot more to learn. And, uh, yeah, this is a big one. We're going to go through, we're going to start with the, uh, beginning of the great depression through the new, the new deal through the end of world war II. So 1929 to 1950, these are big years, big decades. It is what it is. We're, we're, we're doing what we can do. But anyway, so let's, let's go to October of 1929 when the stock market crashed. In reality, a lot of things had been building up to this, not just in 1929 or not t- not just through the 1920s, but really, I mean, this is this is a, a kind of a cycle that had been happening since the beginning of the Gilded Age, which is to say, you know, since um, since finance in northern industry became ascendant um, at the end of the Civil War. So what you have is a combination of financial speculation. So you have, you know, the beginning of financial markets, um, stock being traded with uh, the advent of corporations in the late 1800s. You also have uh, periodical agricultural depressions. So you, you, you see this cycle, right? So the Great Depression happened... Um, in a way, one way of understanding that is it was a particularly bad instance of the kinds of boom and busts that had been happening since the Gilded Age. We're going to, we're going to kind of fast forward from 1929 when the stock market crashed to 1932 when Roosevelt was elected. So Hoover was the Republican candidate and he was he had a policy of, of more or less austerity. He actually did try to implement some social programs, but he's, you know, he's really worried about deficits. And as far as I know, you know, austerity was a way that they were, that they did talk about, um, uh, fiscal policy at that time. Um, so that was a contemporaneous term and it's, it's still roughly the same in the way that we talk about it now in, in terms of, Governments not wanting to spend, not wanting to spend into deficits during an economic downturn. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected in 1932 by promising a very different approach, and he in fact does deliver. Um, and his approach is is bolstered by the economic or the yeah the economic philosophy of John Maynard Keynes, and Keynes was a British economist who said. In, in times of economic downturns, you, you do deficit spending, it doesn't matter, right? The important thing is to not let aggregate demand fall to where the economy is contract, contracting and locked, in, locked into a death spiral, which is what the economy had seen during the Hoover years where people are holding on to their money, right? Because, you, you know, you're, you're keeping your money in your mattress in case of an emergency, And so, you know, the New Deal is really going to kick off pretty much right away um, as soon as Roosevelt gets into office. And it's divided into into two New Deals, because what we call the New Deal is really the the entire agenda of Roosevelt's four terms in office, more or less. Um, Well, at least until... The U.S. joins uh, World War II at the end of 1941. The New Deal is a huge, huge set of programs. You know, he's not Roosevelt is not worried about the price tag, and Congress he's got Congress behind him, and they're not worried about the price tag. But Republicans and business owners are fighting them. You know, every step of the way, Roosevelt just steamrolls them more or less. Um, 
Republicans are going to, uh, are going to fight Roosevelt in the Supreme court. So there's a number of Supreme court challenges and Roosevelt's thought to this is like, okay, well, there's nothing in the constitution saying we can't have 15 Supreme court justices. I'm going to appoint, you know, six more and we're going to get whatever we want done. That's the kind of president that Roosevelt was. Um, and the new deal was a huge, huge endeavor. Um, it's also the consensus is that it was a huge success and that it was the appropriate response to the enormous challenge of the great depression. There's a ton to talk about. There's a ton to learn about. Okay. It's, uh, 1935 and Roosevelt signs what's popularly known as the Wagner act because it was, uh, it was sponsored by, uh, Senator Robert Wagner, um, another Northern Democrat. Um, but its official title is the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. This has been called the most radical piece of legislation in U.S. history. What it did was it was it really, really bolstered the rights of workers to organize. So I've got my notes so I don't forget anything on the spot. Um, the Wagner Act set up the National Labor Relations Board. The National Labor Relations Board, still around today, this was, was set up by the Wagner Act, and this will mediate negotiations between workers and owners of, of companies. So part of part of what the NLRB existing means is that if workers want a union, they're going to get a union. Prior to this, workers could get together and take a vote among, you know, the the working, you know, whoever they decide wants to organize. And if a majority decides, yeah, we want a union, the company could say, oh, that's great. Well, we don't care. We don't recognize your union, you know. Tough luck, guys. Sorry. But now with the NLRB set up, if you have a valid election and the company refuses to recognize your union, you can appeal to the government and you can take it to them and they're going to say, yes, you have a union. Now the, the company has to recognize you. The company has to sit down to and do collective bargaining with you. So the Wagner Act made it... A, made it so that workers could engage in collective bargaining if they wanted to. So part of that is um, it it made it illegal, the Wagner Act made it illegal for companies to fire workers for trying to unionize. This is still, this is still very much illegal. It happens all the time, but the Wagner Act and the NLRB of the time there were actual real consequences for companies trying to fire organ- workers for organizing. It also made company unions illegal, right? So I talked uh, previously about how companies would say, "Oh, we'll give you a we'll give you a workers' association, we'll give you a union," and it was controlled by the company and it didn't do shit for workers. This this is now illegal because. Uh, you know, Wagner and and Roosevelt and the congressional majority during this time recognized that, yeah, company unions are bullshit. They are ways to uh, manipulate workers. Um, It made striking legal. So it protected the work, the right of workers to withhold their labor and to strike. Labor organizing is, is, is supported by the United States government. And union membership uh, shot up. So in 1932, union membership was 3.4 million. By 1942, it had tripled to 10 million in a decade. Um, Oh, also the Wagner Act allowed, uh, allowed for a closed shop um, across the country, which is to say that um, if workers organized the union and if they decided that if the union decided and negotiated a contract with the company, they could say, oh, you have to be part of the union if you're going to work here at all. Um, 
So we're going to talk about Taft Hartley in 1947, which is going to institute, you know, that's going to be the beginning of right to work laws, quote unquote, where um, it's going to make closed shops illegal in right to work states. This is the idiomatic term, right? It's closed. The workplace is closed to non-union members. But I mean, this kind of thing gives unions an enormous amount of power. And when this happens, everybody's, you know, people are flooding into labor unions. People want to be, want to be unionized. Okay. Now they're not going to be killed for trying to organize. They're not going to be fired. They're not going to be evicted. Um, you know, they're not going to have to fight scabs if they want to strike, but, and the national guard and the police, right? This is, this makes it a lot easier for people to unionize. Um, at the same time through the thirties, labor is going to retain a lot of its militancy. So, um, so we're 1935, the Wagner act passes, um, there is a Supreme court challenge. So there's a challenge to the, to the constitutionality of the Wagner act that's going to go to the Supreme court. And after two years, the Supreme court is going to uphold the constitutionality of it. So 1937, right. Uh, worker organizing is popping off. Um, but, but in 1935, you have something else that is very significant happen. Um, and that's the organization of, it's the Congress of Industrial Organizations. And this is kicked off by John L. Lewis. And John L. Lewis, not to be confused with John Lewis of, you know, the civil rights activist and congressperson who recently died. But John L. Lewis was the president of the United Mine Workers of, of America, which is, again, we, I think I, I think I touched on, on that, but, um, the United Mine Workers was uh, a bit more conservative than the Western Federation of Miners. But John Lewis, John L. Lewis and the CIO, this is this is all, this is industrial organizing. So this is a um, they split off from the American Federation of Labor because they wanted to pursue industrial organizing, which was, you know, really articulated in the early 19, in the first decade of the 1900s by the Wobblies and the, and the Western Federation of Miners. For that, um, how do we make sense of Roosevelt, right? I, I want to, I kind of want to establish a little bit of political history here. Roosevelt is a Democrat. And if you will remember from, you know, the reconstruction episode, the Southern Democrats are 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 very racist they're bad guys so what is what do we make of a northern democrat like roosevelt doing something that is good for um poor people who are victims of the great depression it's not the party of lincoln that passed the new deal is what is what i'm trying to get at and the way to understand that is well the democratic party was made up of, of a coalition of southern whites Right. Um, but also northern working people and uh, western farmers, you know, what we understand now is, is the Midwest. So, I mean, really, farmers in any region are tend to be Democrats. Democrats have always since the beginning of the party have supported uh, free trade and farmers like free trade because if they have surpluses, they get to sell their their products to other countries. Um, so. Uh, in the South, the, the South's economy is still largely agricultural through really into, into the 20th century. So a lot of rural farmer types, these, these people are Democrats, um, unless they're black, in which case they're probably going to be Republican because Southern Democrats are incredibly racist and favor segregation and lynching and don't want black people to have human rights at all. Um, and then a lot of Northern black people too are, uh, Republicans as well, but working people in the North, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of labor is, are, are, are Democrats because in the North Republicans are for, um, capitalists and industrialists. So that's kind of how, that's where the coalition is, uh, of, of the democratic party in the early 20th century.
and that's where Roosevelt is going to get the, the political support for his very ambitious program. Um, so a couple of things to say about that. So one thing, right, this is, I've, I've, I've framed this now. I've, I've fallen into the trap of, of, you know, great man of, you know, the great man theory of history and, and attributed this all to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt does get, you know, to his credit, he really did not have, he could have been a second iteration of Hoover. Um, especially Roosevelt was a, was a very rich person, right? He has, he has, he's, his class interests are, you know, what lie with capitalists. Um, and so there's not, there's nothing inevitable about Roosevelt coming in and, and passing the new deal. It could have been very different. And so rather than frame this as, oh, Roosevelt did this, a better way of understanding this is organized labor really brought about the New Deal. And that's what, you know, that's what labor historians will, will emphasize is this was uh, labor organizing that brought about the, the situation where Roosevelt was, was, I mean, he almost had his hand forced, right? People were were up in arms and literally in in many cases and you got the russian revolution in 1917 and people are wondering you know people in power are wondering how much are people you know how much are the working people going to take before they drag us out into the street and and you know execute us and, and try to take over the government you know like the bolsheviks and marxists are thinking this as well leftists at the time are thinking Oh, the stock market crashed. Here's the big one. Here's the big crisis that's going to end capitalism. And so that's kind of the climate at the time. And you have, or you have labor, um, which is very mobilized. I hesitate to say that labor is very organized because I, I can't remember if I if I if I discussed this in the last one, but I. I don't like talking about the labor movement as if it was monolithic, um, because it, I don't I don't think it was. I think that labor there was never one there was never one single coordinated program across the labor movement, and different labor unions and even labor labor federations were in competition with each other. They were rivals with each other, um, or just outright at odds with each other. Um, there were revolutionaries and radicals such as you know the IWW which we talked about and then there were conservative uh, trade unionists and I and then you have things fractured by race and by gender and I don't I don't think it fits neatly into one movement so so I hesitate to say that labor was very organized during this time but labor was very mobilized the point being that working people forced Roosevelt's hand. Roosevelt did not really, I mean, he really took, he took the baton and ran with it to an extent. Um, but, I mean, what he was doing was trying to salvage capitalism. I don't want to present Roosevelt as either good or bad. He, 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 was, he was racist, um, right? Uh, he signed the, the Japanese internment order. Um, he really did not want to accept Jewish refugees from Europe in the, in the 30s, as it's becoming clear, you know, that as the, the, the Holocaust is going on. Um, um, so he, he definitely has his flaws, and the Wagner Act is definitely flawed. Um, and, and so I don't, I don't want to present these things as either good or bad. So you may be familiar with the practice of redlining. I, I mean, so the, a very a very blatant case of racial discrimination brought about by the federal government. Um, but another thing, um, still rate still very racist, a little less uh, a little less explicit um, was was the fact that all of these worker protections that were signed into law with the Wagner Act. They didn't apply to agricultural workers or domestic workers. There's this there's this carve out for those sectors. Hmm. Well, why that? Why might that be? 
Well, the reason is, is that a lot of uh, black people and a lot of immigrants, Asian immigrants and Latin American immigrants work in agriculture. They are the ones who are picking your food. Um, you know, in the, and in the South, you have uh, black sharecroppers, white sharecroppers as well. But the, the racism of the Democratic coalition is not going to allow these sectors to have the same um, to have the same worker protections as industries that are dominated by white workers. And domestic work is, is, is traditionally more uh, done by women. And so you, the New Deal was, was, was definitely racist, right? Um, I'm going to focus in now on the on the UAW, the United Automobile Workers, because I've I've read most I've read a lot about them, and it was a very powerful union, and a very uh, well populated union. At its height, it had a hundred, it had one and a half million members. Um, so I'm going to focus on them. Because, I mean, that's a, that's a huge international, that's a huge union, right? And, the, and they're part of the CIO, and the CIO has, you know, many such unions that are, you know, enormous nationwide unions. But the UAW is, is pretty interesting. But it kind of it gives us a window into, way, into the ways that organized labor went from this militant, communist, you know, in many cases... Uh, communists. And by 1950, by the end of this episode, we're going to see how organized labor uh, became very much about contracts and collective bargaining. So when I, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit, but when I talked about um, the Wagner Act and uh, union recognition and con, you know, the ability to get contracts for unions that wanted it, well, in the view of the Wobblies, right, Wobblies wouldn't organize with contracts. A contract in that view, in, in, in the eyes of radicals like that, were, I mean, it's, it's already kind of a capitulation to capital because they're going to say, no, we're, go- we're not going to sign a contract. We're going to reserve the right to strike or do whatever we want at any time. We're not going to be bound by, you know, your, your bullshit capitalist laws. Um, you know, something, something kind of noble and admirable about that. Um, and, and, and true enough, you know, as soon as you get the Wagner Act, as soon as you get the CIO, as soon as you get industrial organizing based around contracts and collective bargaining, you're, you're, you're playing the game as much as capitalists absolutely hate the Wagner Act. And as much as they hate organized labor in a way, you're playing the game on the capitalist terms. To, to really explicate what, I'm, what I mean by that, we're going to look at the example of the Uni- United Automobile Workers. Um, so they organized in 1935 alongside the CIO. So the UAW is going to organize in these, these industrial centers um, where cars are being built. And cars are a huge, huge part of American industry during this time. So Detroit and Flint, Michigan, and Toledo, Ohio, um, and uh, later, you know, Dearborn, Michigan, these are going to be centers for organized labor. And there's going to be huge union locals in some cases, and a lot of these guys are communists, um, and especially in the in the locals. Again, you have hate strikes. Um, which I talked about before, which is when white workers would go on strike to protest the equality of black workers in their midst. Um, so rather than organize with black workers or see you know a black worker worker get promoted, they would actually go on strike in racial solidarity and white racial solidarity against black people. Um, and this is going to happen through the '40s. Except, in, I mean, union locals that are that are organized by communists and, and mostly communists, communists organize with with black people and with immigrants more readily than white factory worker or whatever. Or you're these, you know, second generation European immigrants who have assimilated. Now they're like, oh, no, we're not 
you know, we hate black people. We're white. We we're, we're racist. Make no, make, make, make no mistake. Anyway. So to get back to the UAW, um, so it, by 1937, you have a wave of what are called sit down strikes in auto factories and auto part factories that sell to the, the, the major automakers. Um, and at this time, GM is not wanting to play ball. General Motors, you know, they do not want to play ball. Ford absolutely does not want to play ball. Um, Henry Ford hates labor unions. He's kind of a right winger. He hates Jewish people. Um, he hates black people. But, you know, Ford is is kind of notoriously, they, they develop this uh, security department, quote unquote, uh, in which they just, they do everything they can. They skirt the law to, you know, bust up unions, um, with force often. But anyway, so you have, uh, these sit down strikes happening in a lot of general motors plants and factories. Um, and what this is, is, you know, one of the ways to get around being replaced by scabs is to just actually take over the factory and so this is what a lot of workers would do is like okay at the signal you're just going to sit down at your job and you're going to physically occupy the plant um and then members of your community members of your union are going to bring in food or whatever um and you're gonna have a picket line around the factory so you can't get police in you can't get scabs in um and this is this gets this gets bloody oftentimes uh, you have you do have the police you know called out of course in in 1937 there's there's this um there's a strike that's mythologized as the running of the bulls but what's notable about this is you've got roosevelt who's friendly to labor and the governor of michigan at that time frank murphy who was also friendly to labor and so he calls out the national guard to come and protect the strike so normally the National Guard comes out to break up the picket line and let scabs in, but he said he preempts, you know, the, the local city police who were out there trying to break up the strike. And he, he says, oh, no, we're going to send in the National Guard to protect this strike. Um, he can't do that indefinitely, but he, it, it's notable that, you know, now the government is the, the, the state and the federal government is on the on the side of these striking factory workers. Um, and, and, uh, the strike is success. These, these strikes are successful and the UAW organizes general motors in it by the end of 19. Well, I think it happens in 19, early 1938. Um, you're not going to get, so, so in 1938, the same year, um, you have a guy named Walter Ruther who's going to later become the president of the United Automobile Workers. Um, he he gets beat up by Ford's security forces. So they're on public property and they got all the, the proper permits and everything. And this is, by the way, that whole process, this is kind of... Um, emblematic of this of this shift of like oh we've got the law on our, kind of on our side now so we're going to do things by the book they get permits to, to hand out leaflets on public property outside of um outside of a massive new ford plant and ford sends his goons out there and they uh beat the shit out of 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 walter ruther and his colleagues in the uaw um completely illegally and they and they you know they they have like witnesses they have journalists out there they have people taking photos and they these guys grab you know the cameras of everybody they can find and break their cameras and destroy the film um just destroy the evidence but one one person makes it out of there and the next day his photo of 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 ruther all bloodied and beaten up and and um the other guys there um, that's on the, that's on the front page of the papers in Detroit. And it's like, Hey, look, look what Ford is doing to unionizing workers. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're, we're still a far cry away from the Ludlow massacre, um, of, you know, 20 years before, 
there is still this outright violence against labor organizing. Um, Ford will hold out against recognizing the UAW until 1941. And they're just, I mean, even with the Wagner Act, even with Roosevelt, they're just powerful enough to avoid, you know, having to recognize the union. But by that time, you've got, um, you've got all of the auto manufacturers organized by the UAW. So hugely, hugely powerful, hugely influ- influential. Um, and by the beginning of, by, or by the time that the U.S. enters World War II in late t- 1941, um, Walter Ruther is making these pitches to the public and he's going on the radio and saying, hey, we have this, you know, due to the cyclical nature of auto manufacturing, we have these plants that have this downtime while they're retooling and so on. Let's use that to make planes. Let's, so he's pitching this program to the public about, the, about what the factory um, that his workers work for should be doing with their factories, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is unheard of at this point. I point this out because, you know, this is like saying, this is like, okay, you know, right now it's, it's April 4th, uh, 2021. And, uh, you know, I, we don't know the results of, of the Amazon warehouse, you know, union election in Bessemer, Alabama, the Amazon, um, union election, but this is almost, this is like, okay, imagine that union drive is successful and you've got the union workers successfully organized and their leader is now saying, hey, we want to use these Amazon warehouses to, uh, you know, we want to retool them to be, you know, community centers or something. I mean, this is this is essentially what Ruther is, is saying in Ford and the auto guys are are losing their minds. I mean, they're they're livid about this, but there's nothing really that they can do because unions have a lot of control. There's surging demand for any kind of heavy industry because the United States is is supplying the war effort for our allies, you know, in, in England and in France and so on. Um, um, and then once the U.S. enters the war, a lot of workers are now soldiers and they're going over and, um, you know, at some point during World War Two. The United, the United States reaches, for the only time in its history, fully 0% unemployment. So absolutely everybody, um, you know, this is full workforce participation. Um, you know, women are working in factories, right? You got the famous Rosie the Riveter um, poster. You know, black people are, are getting jobs where they had previously faced discrimination. Because there is absolutely the Industrial Reserve Army that we've talked about is is pretty nearly depleted. I, w- I want to point that out, right? So this Industrial Reserve Army is so expansive that it takes you know it takes a huge labor movement and a world war, you know, an unprecedented world war funded by unprecedented deficit spending under the part of the federal government. It takes that to, you know, use up that industrial reserve army. Um, and so workers are, are really, really empowered through the forties, but something else is going on in, in the early forties and that's McCarthyism. And so I talk about Ruther, um, because I've, I, I think he's a really compelling figure. I actually, I, I wrote a screenplay. I wrote a screenplay about his life. It's for sale. Hit me up. I'd love to sell it to you and you can make a movie out of it. It'd be great. Um, but I, you know, I've, I've, I've studied his life and he's kind of a fascinating figure. He's a, he's a socialist and he and his brother actually went in the, in the early thirties to work in the United, in the, in the USSR in auto factories. And they were like, this is great, right? These are, these are leftists. Um, but as he, you know, rises in the ranks of, of the UAW and as he becomes president by the early uh, forties, he starts, 
he becomes party to the purging of communists from the labor movement. So McCarthyism and all this Red Scare stuff and all of this is driving a wedge between the radicals and the more, you know, respectable union types. And the Communist Party is a big force in the labor movement. And to a large extent, the labor movement is really a, a, a safe harbor for communists uh, during this time. Um, and Ruther, you know, goes from being a, so a socialist to um, basically selling out the communists who he had formally organized with and he had, you know, been in coalition with and who had supported his rise. And it kind of comes to a head where there's a UAW uh, union local, number 600, but they're organized in this big Ford plant and there's like 30,000 members of this local. And it's led by communists and it's got a good base of communists and black workers. Um, and, uh, and Ruther reaches a point where, you know, I mean, it kind of becomes this inside baseball at a certain point, but he basically, he, he, he removes the leadership um, of, of this local. This is happening across the, the, the labor movement where labor leaders are purging radicals from, from labor unions. Um, at a time when labor, I mean, labor has unprecedented power. So it's, it's a bit of a, you know, why is this happening? Well, I mean, it, you're, it, one way of interpreting, interpreting this is that labor unions are becoming more of a part of the political structure. They're becoming more of a part of the political firmament. And um, by, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll kind of skip ahead to the end of the war. Um, so the war ends 1945 and labor during this time, the war is winding down and labor is, is thinking, well, I hope we have jobs after this. So that's a concern, right? In retrospect, this seems, I mean, I mean what we know is the fifties and in the sixties were incredibly prosperous times for most workers, blue collar workers, factory workers had unprecedented job security and, um, you know, compensation. Well, I mean, the fact is a lot of women lost their jobs when the soldiers came home. A lot of black people lost their jobs at the end of the war. Um, but this was also, you know, this was the beginning of a, of a generation of very prosperous conditions for blue collar workers. Um, but as soon as the war is over, uh, capital is, is, is just fighting organized labor tooth and claw, even as, you know, uh, labor is pretty well purged their ranks of communists by this time. So in 1947, the Taft-Hartley Act passes, which repeals a lot of the Wagner Act labor protections. It introduces the possibility of states to be right to work states. That, I mean, that happens in, in the forties. I mean, it's going to really accelerate, uh, over the next couple of decades. But in 1950 something, uh, something significant happens to Walter Ruther in the UAW. And it's called the Treaty of Detroit. And basically, Ruther comes together with the, the leaders of, of the, the big automakers, the big three, and they sign a contract for five years. And they say, hey, we're gonna get, you know, um, you get cost of living increases and, and pensions and in exchange, you know, we're going to get these, we're going to get fairly compensated in exchange. We're not going to strike. So the UAW signs a contract saying they will not strike for the next five years. Um, and this is in hindsight, it's a mistake, right? Like, it's hard to interpret. So I'm going to talk about in the next episode, I'm going to talk about deindustrialization. We're going to pick it up from 1950 into the 60s, into the 70s. Um, and labor is going to be immensely powerful over these next day, over these next decades. But this, this Treaty of Detroit in particular, this marks a, marks a turning point where 
you don't have you don't have strikes and you're not you're not busting heads and you're not fighting with the cops and but by 1950 all of this all of these negotiations are going to happen uh with you know white dudes in suits and ties and that's where that's where the battle is now it's over board boardrooms and it's and it's partly because you know labor has millions of members right you you're representing tons and tons of people but you're also you got the government involved and you've got the national labor relations board involved you've got these things happening at such a high level um that you're bargaining over you know cost of living increases and you're bargaining over um you know what you know how how workers get promoted and um and this is going to work out great for workers as a whole but when they gave up their you know when they gave up the right to strike i mean that's that's the most powerful thing that that workers have and you know you get it's, it's a, there's a trade off i'm i'm not i'm not necessarily criticizing ruther um for this you know i mean it seemed like a great deal i'm sure and you get something in return, but that's that's a huge trade-off. And what we know is that labor is not going to have this; they're not going to hold on to that perch forever. Anyway, so that covers what I wanted to talk about through 1950. I did want to do a little bit of analysis, and I mean, I did I did some, but I kind of want to talk a little bit more about like, well, what is it? What do we make of? What do we make of of the New Deal? Right, as leftists, as labor historians, what do we make of all this? Um, so I want to talk about uh, a Marxist named Karl Polanyi. I, I don't know if, that, if that's how you say his name, actually. I think it's a Polish name. Um, but he's a Marxist uh, a theorist, and he published a book in 1944, I believe, called The Great Transformation. And his 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 idea is basically let's make sense of of the rise of fascism um you know he's 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 looking at the third reich and saying where does this come from and what he does is he goes back into you know 18th century europe when when countries began to pass what are called enclosure acts it encloses off um commons that were usually that were previously used by communities to graze their livestock and now it says okay these are these are going to be fenced these are going to be privately owned and um in polyanese of uh, uh interpretation of 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 this in particular and he looks you know at the way that this kind of thing he looks at other examples too but he 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 he, he looks at the history of enclosure acts and the ways that this impacted communities. And this is this had huge impacts on communities, right? This disrupted the the very social fabric of 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 peasants and of of workers. And he he um he p- kind of pinpoints three things that became traded as commodities and that which had hugely disruptive impacts on communities and that's labor land and currency and he says you should never treat these things as commodities you should never trade these things these things should be you know held in common um and he kind of traces so he basically says that this this move toward commoditizing these 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 resources led to such a disruption of of community that by the early 1900s you have people who you have communities that are so fractured that you know whole countries are turning to fascism and at the same time you know you have whole countries you have the soviet union forming as a, as a counter response right there's 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 this kind of forked path and I'm, I'm really, I'm, I find this explanation pretty convincing. I mean, capitalism has been a hugely destructive force to the social fabric. Um, and this applies very well 
to uh, the United States since the Gilded Age. Um, and I think it's very, I think it's, I think it's worth considering that when you have, when you have capitalism driving social change, which we started to, you know, which we see and which we have, capital doesn't give a, sh- you know, capital doesn't care about social ties. Capital doesn't care about your community. Capital wants to wants to buy and sell your land and wants to treat your labor as a commodity. And humans aren't built that way. We're not. We don't function that way. And so it creates this, you know, this widespread anxiety when that kind of thing happens. And you get people, you know, fighting labor wars. Um, you get people drawn to fascism with its, you know, its promise to this imagined, you know, glorious past. And there were a lot of fascists in the United States in the in the thirties. Um, and you get, you know, you get radicals, you get anarchists, you get communists. These are these are this is the response to capitalism. You you put everything into a you put the community into a blender, and humans start to freak out. Um, and so I think that there's an element. So when we look at the the Great Depression and the New Deal, I think there's an element of just people like. And I mean, I mean, going back to, you know, the Knights of Labor and the Great Railroad Strike and and this militant labor stuff, there's an element of people who are just like, I, you know, I don't know what's going on because the whole foundation of my parents' way of life is just completely non-existent for me. It's a scary thing. I mean, I've, I've kind of experienced, I've been <laughs> experiencing that. I think that's a, a generational thing for Millennials. I think technically I'm a millennial. Um, so I think that's that's kind of one way that I understand this this period of, of history. It's hard to fully make sense of this stuff in in the way that, like, if we're leftists and it, you know, presuming that the New Deal is something that we want to replicate, minus the racism, presumably, right? Assuming this is something that we want to replicate, and we want to say, well, how do we get there again? I, it, it becomes very hard to say. It's such a big, complex thing. And the bottom line is, like, hey, I don't know. And I don't think anybody knows. Maybe somebody knows. Um, anyway, I, I hope that, that there's a lot of ways to analyze this. And this should be just a beginning. I hope that you weren't going into this episode looking for or into this series looking for, you know, a set of prescriptions. I'm not going to give you that. Um, and I don't, th- I don't think you should trust people who want to give you that, frankly. I, just, I think it's too, everything's too contingent on time and place, and, and it's too complex. Um, anyway, thanks for joining. I'm going to do a bonus, by the way. I'm going to talk about labor historiography, and in particular, I'm going to talk about, you know, gender bias. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I'm not going to do that today. I had to think about it, but I'm not going to do that. Anyway, thanks for joining, and see you next time.